Hi everyone, my name is Chanel Martinez and I'm the Vice President of STEM Talent Programs at the New York Academy of Sciences. For the last 200 years, the Academy has been working to drive innovative solutions to society's challenges by advancing scientific research, education, and policy. I oversee the Academy's education programming, which is aimed at preparing students from grade school to grad school for the STEM careers of tomorrow. I'm thrilled to be moderating this afternoon's panel on workforce development for the emerging quantum economy. We all know that there are a variety of applications for quantum computing, but a shortage of talent, which has a significant impact on the future of the industry. With very few direct pipelines from universities and most quantum scientists trained as generalists rather than specialists, there's a difficulty in recruiting and retaining talent in the field. Today, we're going to hear from three panelists on this topic. So with that, let's jump right in. I'd like to ask the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, Marie, let's start with you. Hi, I'm Mari McInnes, president of Stony Brook University. Having studied and worked at public research institutions throughout my career, I know that quantum information science and technology is a dynamic and a world-shaping field. I also know this rapidly evolving field represents an incredible opportunity for a university like ours one that fosters cutting edge research, creativity, equity, and inclusivity as part of its core mission. As one of the leading universities in reducing inequality and promoting social mobility, Stony Brook sends more than 7,500 graduates into the workforce and deeper into their academic careers each year. We prepare our students to excel both within their programs and beyond them as contributors and leaders. We want to make sure they are on the cutting edge, learning vital skills and gaining knowledge that will be relevant for years to come. So we are both excited by the challenge and confident in our ability to meet the growing demand in quantum information science and technology. As a new president, I want to invest in cross-disciplinary scholarship and research that can provide creative and groundbreaking solutions to our societal complexities. You can already see this in multiple programs and centers at Stony Brook, but especially in our efforts in QIST. We are building on our already long history with QIST from the early flux qubits and entanglement theory to the current effort in communication, simulations, algorithms, and materials. Now we're expanding faculty and working diligently on new academic offerings such as our soon-to-be-launched cross-disciplinary Masters of Science program in quantum information science and technology, a program that is remarkable both in the SUNY system and in the nation. This is the way that research universities can and must remain both relevant and integral to our progress as a community, as a country, and as a world. As researchers, we have the ability to both shape the future and respond to it. At Stony Brook, our commitment is to grow alongside QIST so that we can respond to this workforce demand with ingenuity, responsibility, and experience. Thank you so much for having me today. It's an honor to be here along with my fellow panelists, and I so look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Harriet, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to join Dr. McGuinness and Professor Oliver for this important panel discussion. My name is Harriet Kung. I currently serve as the Deputy Director for Science Programs in DOE's Office of Science, which is the nation's largest funder for physical sciences. Prior to that, I was a scientist and project leader at Los Angeles. National Laboratory. My research and management career has been primarily in the DOE system as a federal manager in DOE headquarters and comments today. In terms of workforce development, probably our biggest contribution in the DOE's Office of Science is through the actual support and proactive management of research. A cornerstone of this approach has been our establishment of multidisciplinary multi-institutional research centers devoted to tackling major challenges in energy. 
The key here is to bring together senior investigators, graduate students, and postdocs, and force them into energetic, integrated research teams. For the graduate students and postdocs, as well as senior investigators at various stages of their careers, the very experience of research, including research in a team setting, is perhaps the best form of training and development, shaping both knowledge and skills. One example I would like to give is the Energy Frontier Research Centers program in the Office of Basic Energy Sciences. These centers often represent partnerships of multiple institutions, in some cases involving universities, national laboratories, nonprofit organizations, and private industry. They bring together senior investigators from multiple disciplinaries in search of major breakthroughs. Graduate students and postdocs play an integral role in the research teams at these centers. One consequence of the program has been a very strong sense of belonging belonging on the part of the, especially the more junior researchers, a sense of being a part of something greater than oneself, which is a tremendous inspiration and motivator. In this way, the EFRCs have been a fertile training ground for a whole new generation of energy scientists, and equally importantly, have encouraged the development of a highly collaborative, multidisciplinary approach to science at a time when these qualities are increasingly important for tackling the big scientific challenges of our era, including the focus of this event, quantum information science. So I'll stop here and turn it over to Professor Oliver. Great, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Dr. McInnes and Dr. Kong. It's really nice to be here. Um, my name is William Oliver and I'm Associate Professor of EECS at MIT. I'm also a laboratory fellow at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and I've been working uh, in the area of quantum information science for about 20 years, and in particular on the development of um, superconducting quantum computers. As you know, quantum computation holds the promise to transform computation as we know it this century, at, perhaps in a way that's as important as classical computing did in the last century. But in order for us to fully realize this promise, we need to have a workforce uh, that can help us develop these technologies and bring them up to the level of um, engineering that we need to, 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 to fully um, execute these programs. And so what this means is we need to develop a new field called quantum engineering. And so in this context, um, I helped to form at MIT the Center for Quantum Engineering and its associated industrial consortium called the QSEC, the Quantum Science and Engineering Consortium. And I'd be glad to talk more about that uh, throughout, this, uh, throughout this session. But two, let me just mention that two of the uh, motivations for forming the, the center and its industrial consortium were pr primarily to promote education and also workforce development. And, and this spans you know, not just the university activities for undergraduate and graduate students, but it, it starts at secondary education, uh, perhaps even earlier. And importantly, it continues out into the, um, uh, once people are out in the workforce. So professional education or professional development are going to be critical to realize uh, this promise of quantum information. And so one, one last point to make is in this context uh, at MIT through the MITx Professional Development um, center, we were, we developed a 16 week course, four course series, 16 weeks in total um, of classes that address the fundamentals and the practical realities of quantum computing, but targeting people who are already uh, in industry today. And we've had more than 2000 learners uh, so far. I think these are the kinds of things that we need to do um, to, to promote workforce development, uh, get a broader range of people uh, with broader ranges of expertise. Uh, into the quantum space and helping us develop future quantum computers and quantum technologies. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. So, Mari, I'd like to start with you. Um, given your current role as president of Stony Brook University, what is the role for universities in responding to the workforce challenge associated with a rapidly evolving new field such as quantum information science and technology? Yeah, on, on the broadest level, universities 
particularly research institutions, play a significant role in advancing scientific discovery by spurring innovation and ultimately building a pipeline of skill and talent to meet future societal needs. Quantum information science and technology has already demonstrated the potential to transform our commuting, computing and communications, boost the U.S. and global economy, and provide national security benefits. The Department of Energy, other federal agencies, private sector organizations, and academia are all working together, as we must, to help ensure our country's leadership in the new quantum economy. The National Quantum Initiative Act of 2018 emphasizes the need to expand the number of researchers, educators, and students with training in quantum information science and technology to develop a workforce pipeline. This will begin with academic studies in the fields of physics, computer science, chemistry, math, and engineering. The convergence of these disciplines could lead to significant technological advances and meaningful new opportunities for students pursuing the field, today's students who will comprise tomorrow's workforce. A recent study by the University of Colorado and Rochester Institute of Technology speaks to the role of higher education in preparing for the quantum revolution and identifies five main types of careers available within the industry. Engineer, experimental scientist, theorist, technician, and application researcher. Given the 10-year support plan mandated by the Quantum Information Act, employment in this field is projected to grow substantially in five to 10 years. The Quantum Computing Report currently lists 190 startup or private companies working on quantum computing. Even conservative estimates from that number translate to significant job growth in this sector. And we, in higher education, can help fill those positions with qualified candidates by offering new degree programs, such as the Quantum Information Science and Technologies Master's programs, research experiences in QIS and quantum technologies, and experiential learning or talent exchange programs with national laboratories and industry. We also need to emphasize the exciting possibilities of pursuing this cutting edge field once students complete their academic experience, hopefully as future faculty members, but also as research scientists, government lab scientists and technicians, policymakers, or in the private sector. As president of Stony Brook University on Long Island, I am proud and inspired by our commitment to fill these needs for business and respond to the evolving needs of our world, which at the same time opens up a whole new array of career prospects for our students. Stony Brook's engagement in emerging fields such as quantum information science and technology is well established over our 63 year history and emblematic of our mission to further science, research, and discovery. Along with other institutions of higher education, we're excited to answer the call to action in this emerging field. Thank you. And Harriet, given your role as Deputy Director of DOE's Office of Science, could you briefly summarize what programs and strategies DOE has to support workforce development for this rapidly evolving field? Thank you for the question. Um, advances in quantum information science will no doubt lead to transformational changes that impacts all in the future with benefits to our national security, economic competitiveness, as well as Americans' continued leadership in science. In this vein, the DOE Office of Science plays a unique role in the multidisciplinary ecosystem that is needed to foster and facilitate the advancement of QIS in the United States. We are bringing together technical capabilities and scientific expertise across the DOE national laboratories, academic institutions, and industrial partners we support to build teams 
that can tackle this quantum challenge. Each element of the Office of Science QIS program has education and workforce development built into it, leveraging different strengths to form an integrated approach to address our workforce needs for the future. The recently announced DOE Quantum Information Science Research Centers is a good example. These five centers will focus on a range of key research topics, including quantum networking, sensing, computing, and materials manufacturing. Each center incorporates a collaborative team spanning multiple scientific and engineering disciplines and multiple institutions. Through these connections, each center will serve as a nexus for building a sustaining part of the pipeline that is needed for a competitive quantum workforce. Host laboratories will integrate quantum information science into broader outreach and educational activities through their existing STEM and K-12 initiatives, nurturing our next generation of quantum science engineering experts. QIS focused internships and apprenticeships at national laboratories, universities, and industry partners while draw new scientists and engineers into the program. Academic degrees and certification in quantum computing um, and QIS uh, will enable members of this multidisciplinary teams to take the next step in their career as the impact of QIS continue to broaden. In addition to the centers, the DOE Office of Science also continue to support fundamental QIS research through our core science programs. These research awards support graduate students and postdocs that will become key members of the QIS field. Some of our QIS research awards are exploring uh, new potential connections across the disciplines, building new cohorts in these emerging fields of study. A number of our awardees are also working with their home and partner institutions to develop high school modules and other local outreach programs. In addition, our existing comprehensive workforce development programs is also enhanced by QIS activities at all levels. For example, the prestigious Early Career Research Program, the Office of Science Graduate Student Research Programs, and the Computational Science Graduate Fellowships similarly support research opportunities in QIS and quantum computing. Our national laboratories offer quantum research opportunities for undergraduates through the Science Undergraduate, undergraduate Laboratory Internships SULI program. Together, these and many other efforts across the DOE Office of Science are building a quantum network of laboratory, academic, and industrial partners to enable the development of the workforce will need to realize the full benefits of QIS. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. Um, now, William, given your role as a leading professor at MIT and researcher at MIT Lincoln Lab, can you briefly summarize what programs and strategies MIT has developed to support workforce development in this area? Yeah, sure. sure. Thank you, Chanel. I'm happy to describe some of these activities. Um, you know, as I look back at quantum development, say, over the last 20 or 30 years, um, what I've noticed and others have noticed, too, is that we're, we've definitely shifted within the past few years from something that looks like a you know, laboratory or scientific curiosity to something that clearly is a technical reality. Um, of course, there's a long way to go, but, but, but what we've recognized is that quantum information is real and it's happening. And we're moving from the model where a single professor and his or her students as a generalist can do everything in a vertically integrated sense to a, a, a time when we need a broad range of talent. Um, across many, many fields, many of which are not going to be rooted necessarily in physics or quantum information. And so in this context, you know, we thought about what, what do we need to do to help fill this pipeline? And, and we came up with basically two strategies. And one is that how can we take the talent that we currently have and pivot that talent 
to uh, the, the problems that we have in quantum information. And the second is, okay, how do we take young students and essentially develop new talent? Okay, so on the first topic, um, I mentioned uh, just a few moments ago about the MIT X Pro professional development courses. And this is an example um, of developing new courseware for people who are already in industry. Um, they're, they generally will have a professional degree of some sort, and maybe they've been working five, 10, 15 years, um, but they want to take their knowledge and now apply it to quantum. But it's a new field. There's a lot of new terminology, a lot of jargon. And how can we train people um, who clearly are very intelligent people? They're just not familiar necessarily with quantum and, and how it works. And so that was what motivated us to develop this uh, four course series. Uh, it was underwritten by generous support from IBM and developed two, two and a half years ago. Um, I was the faculty lead along with Ike Chuang Aram Harrow and Peter Shore, all professors at MIT. And what we came up with was four courses, uh, four weeks long each, um, video based, so about 160 videos, and uh, people will take this course online. And um, the idea is that we introduce them to the fundamentals uh, and then the practical realities of uh, quantum computing and quantum communication. Uh, since, since we launched this, we've had more than 2000 learners um, and, and it's been a real, I would say, a real success. The, the feedback we've got uh, so far has been tremendous. More than 90% of the people say that they're, uh, it met their objectives and they're satisfied. Um, and, and one thing that they really like is at the end of each four week course, uh, we pose a real problem like a deutsch josa algorithm or Grover's algorithm, uh, something like this. And, and what they'll do is they'll implement that algorithm for themselves on one of IBM's online uh, cloud quantum computers. And so we teach them how to program. You don't have to be a programmer, but we, we teach them what they need to know in order to run through these problems and get an idea for uh, what it means to actually program a quantum computer. So um, this is an example of the types of uh, programs that we need to develop and continue developing to take people who are already in industry professionals and have them pivot towards quantum. Now, in terms of generating new talent, of course, um, we need to address uh, people who are students who are in secondary educational level, as well as undergraduate and graduate students. And this is one of the main motivations uh, at the Center for Quantum Engineering at MIT. And, and, and basically, the question that we're addressing surrounds curriculum development. There is this new concept that we're moving into an engineering phase. So science is definitely not over. Let me emphasize this, that science and engineering together will lead us to the quantum future. But what is quantum engineering? Um, what are the textbooks that we need to write? What is the curriculum and the courses that are going to surround this new field called quantum engineering? And so with support from the Laboratory for Physical Sciences, uh, we have begun to address these questions, which is to develop this new curriculum, think about what textbooks do we need to write, and integrate quantum thinking uh, into the courses at MIT. It's a work in progress. You know, we, we just started this about a year ago and we're continuing, but I think that this is the path forward to help train undergraduates and graduate students um, and have them have, give them a better understanding of what quantum is. Now, of course, in addition to that, we need to su support our undergraduates and graduate students financially. So, um, you know, one example are the Doc Bedard three-year graduate fellowships that we have at the Center for Quantum Engineering. But we need to do more of this to ensure that students will be able to follow uh, and pursue their passions uh, in the areas of quantum. And then the last thing is I would mention is that um, it's not too early to start training uh, students in high school or even younger. And I'll just mention one example. There was a program this past summer called Qubit by Qubit, um, hosted by the uh, nonprofit uh, coding school. And a couple of my students, my graduate students, helped to teach that course this summer. And they had over 300 high school students um, worldwide who joined in uh, for this course. And um, at the end of the week, we had a discussion about uh, which I participated in about what the next steps would be for people who want to pursue um, further education and careers in quantum. So I don't think that there's a, a single silver bullet that's going to just magically make all this happen, but through an array of these types of programs, um, we will be able to reach our quantum future.
Thank you, William. And Mari, back over to you. Um, what specific strengths and programs does Stony Brook University bring to prepare today's students to enter tomorrow's workforce in the field of quantum information science and technology? Yeah. Stony Brook University's strengths in quantum information science are a direct result of our world-leading research in quantum physics. We have a core of outstanding quantum information scientists leading efforts in quantum communications, quantum sensing, quantum materials, and QIS theory. Paramount to these efforts is our close partnership with Brookhaven National Lab. We recently demonstrated a working long-distance quantum network between Stony Brook and Brookhaven Lab, which is the longest quantum communication experiment in the U.S. to date. In February 2019, Stony Brook organized a State University of New York-wide quantum immersion workshop for physics and engineering faculty from many campuses, as well as representatives from industry, Air Force Research Lab, and Brookhaven Lab. We also just developed a 30-credit Master's of Science program in quantum information science and technology with cross-disciplinary courses in a broad range of physical, information, and engineering sciences. We're really excited about this new program, which we hope will be up and running by next fall. It will be a first for SUNY schools and one of only a handful of other university programs across the nation. Graduates will have the foundational knowledge and skills to contribute to research in the academy and national labs, as well as techno technology development and related vocations in the quantum industry. Additionally, we have a current par partnership with BNL, Suffolk County Community College, and Farmingdale State College through the NSF-funded Alliance for Graduate Education and the Professorate. This is a diversity-focused effort on doctoral training, which we will be expanding to include QIST as a core focus. And we are providing research opportunities in the quantum field from high school through the highest levels of graduate studies. To meet these needs, Stony Brook is expanding its QIST faculty with new additions in the physics and astronomy and computer science departments. We just won the NSF Quantum Computing and Information Science Faculty Fellows Grant. I'm really proud of the strides we're making to ensure our graduates are well-trained in a field that we expect to transform our understanding of the world. We want to ensure that our students have the ability to meet the growing demands of quantum information science and technology over the next decade and beyond. Thank you very much. Um, William, now I want to ask you a more general question, um, and that is how we can introduce concepts of quantum information earlier into a curriculum when quantum mechanics is a challenging topic that's not generally taught until mid-undergraduate. Yes, thank you. So that's a fantastic question and one that we are thinking about um, almost every day at MIT and I'm sure elsewhere. Um, I think you know, generally, whenever we teach a course to students, we need to tailor the message to the level of the students that we're teaching, right? And quantum is certainly no different, but has the added challenge that, you know, generally, the effects that we see in quantum mechanics are not intuitive. We don't see them in our everyday lives. And so it's often difficult to make a connection between the effects that we observe in quantum systems and our everyday lives, you know, to, to build this intuition. But it's not impossible. And I think that generally speaking, what we try to do is to integrate problems into the existing course curricula that have a connection to quantum without being explicitly um, quantum mechanical or requiring a, a, a prior knowledge of quantum mechanics. And so I can give one example um, that we introduce into a course I'm teaching on probability. So as you may know, quantum mechanics is a probabilistic theory, and um, there are rules that govern how these uh, particles, quantum particles, interact with one another. 
and it's called quantum statistics. And there's different types of quantum statistics, Bose statistics and Fermi statistics. And of course, you'll learn about that in a quantum mechanics class and a quantum statistics class. But you don't need to have taken those classes to actually apply the rules and understand how things work. And so in our, in our um, probability class, what we can do is we can talk about what happens when two particles collide together. We give a probability model. We describe how they interact. And if they're electrons, then they anti-bunch. And if they're photons, they'll bunch. So that sounds like jargon, but in a, in a probability class, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, what we can do is give the probability problem, ask how would two particles that collide uh, exit, say, a beam splitter, given this rule, right? And we can say this is a rule that you'll find in quantum mechanics. You'll learn about that in the future. But, but by doing this, you know, just as just one example, by, but by introducing these problems at an earlier stage in existing um, courses that we have, we can start to build a student's intuition about quantum mechanical behavior, even if they don't explicitly know the quantum mechanics behind it, they may not even know that this is a quantum problem, but they start to see the results in their, you know, everyday courses. And through this, they will build an internal um, intuition and appreciation for quantum effects that will serve them later downstream. Thank you. And would anyone else like to um, jump in with a response to that? Okay. Um, Harriet, on to you. Uh, the DOE labor force is drawn from many science and engineering disciplines. From your perspective, how do you get a broader range of people involved in developing quantum technologies, not just physicists? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, as a mission agency, DOE has uh, indeed ample experience in forging multidisciplinary team to tackle ma major challenges. Um, there are numerous examples, human genome projects that will bring scientists, technologists together uh, to our uh, energy challenges. Uh, these are really multidimensional challenges that uh, will indeed uh, need expertise and talent beyond just a single uh, domain science, uh, including uh, physics. Uh, I think for an emerging field of quantum science and technology, and just as uh, Professor Oliver has mentioned, it has really moved beyond just a concept uh, to a uh, emerging reality. Uh, um, and, and we indeed have found this uh, field in terms of uh, bringing teams together, the op opportunity space is quite rich and expensive. Uh, in my view, there are a number of key aspects for us to really making sure that we can engage a broader range of people involved to tackle uh, these challenges. One, in my view, is to broaden the engagement with the community beyond, as you said, just the physics community. Uh, if we look at uh, the different program offices in DOE Office of Science, each of them has been actively engaging uh, with their respective community. And QIS is kind of unique in a way that all, seems, uh, all of the science programs in Office of Science uh, have equities uh, to contribute to QIS. And I think that's one of the beauty of uh, bringing a multidisciplinary team here. Uh, our programs from advanced scientific computing to basic energy sciences to biology to fusion sci uh, energy sciences, uh, high energy physics, nuclear physics, to isotopes. Each of the programs has some unique aspects to collect it, come together uh, to make QIS a reality. And that I think is a very important part of broadening the engagement uh, with the community. I think as part of this broadening community engagement, there's also the critical need to continue to identify gaps in knowledge and technology. Uh, I think one of the hallmarks for Office of Science is our very robust strategic planning process uh, through these roundtables or community-based basic research and workshops to identify priority research needs. Uh, after identifying these needs, we need to clearly communicate these opportunities to the community so we can then ensure that we attract the talent and expertise needed 
to bridge these knowledge and technology gaps. Um, what we think, what I think is also very important is to create that ecosystem to promote and foster that multidisciplinary approaches. Uh, from my fellow panelists, we have indeed heard that the needs are quite diverse and wide ranging. And DOE is com committed to working with our community as well as other federal agencies to foster and steward the field to ensure that uh, multidisciplinary ecosystem to ensure a healthy pipeline of sustained workforce development uh, for QIS. So uh, this is uh, uh, my own, own observations of uh, the QIS need in this case. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment on this question? No? Okay. Well, I think with that, um, we've run out of time. Thank you to all the panelists for this fantastic discussion. Um, we heard some great insights on how we can support workforce development in this space. And the goal is obviously to continue to expand the quantum ecosystem and support innovation in this area. And for that, we know we need to grow that pipeline of quantum experts. So I'd like to now turn it to each of you um, just for some, some closing remarks and some thoughts. Uh, Harriet, how about, would you like to start? Um, again, thank you very much for including me uh, to be part of this really fun and, and enlightening panel. Uh, I've learned a lot uh, uh, from listening to both uh, Dr. McInnes and Professor Oliver. And as a funding agency, uh, we're indeed committed to working with your communities to ensure that we have indeed a healthy, robust pipeline uh, for this critically important field, not only for national security, economic uh, prosperity, but also the U.S. scientific leadership going into the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, William. Yeah, thank you again for, you know, inviting me to participate on this panel. I also learned quite a bit. It was a pleasure to be here with Dr. McInnes and Dr. Kung. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I think there's a tremendous promise to be realized with quantum technologies and clearly with implications for both national and economic security. Uh, and there are many facets uh, to achieving that promise, but one very important one is workforce development and uh, the education and developing the curriculum to do so. And uh, so many of the things that we outlined today, uh, the strategies and approaches um, we need to follow them, and when we do, we will realize uh, our quantum future. Thank you. Thank you. And Mari, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much for including me in the panel today, and, and I, too, learned so much from my panelists. Um, at Stony Brook University, we are dedicated to broadening our participation in all fields of study and supporting inclusive excellence and success in all academic and career pursuits. We strive to ensure that underrepresented students have both the access to enter and the support to excel in STEM fields. And as science comes together across disciplines to service the emerging quantum field, we see a critical need and an opportunity to ensure diversity in our scientists. Therefore, we are launching a new study on the psychosocial factors that promote STEM career achievement and engagement among underrepresented students. And we will be applying these results within the context of the field of quantum information science, which speaks loudly to our commitment to equity and workforce diversity. As our societal needs evolve and change, this is an opportunity to broaden our knowledge rather than limit it. And we look forward to working with the larger field, uh, the Department of Energy, our partners at Brookhaven Lab, um, and really everyone in support of growing the workforce pipeline for QIST. Great, thank you everyone.